Right. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. So I'm going to focus on discussing large scale electricity storage on Great Britain and the net zero era. I'm going to assume very high levels of wind and solar, and I'm not going to discuss the small amount, small amount of storage we're going to need to provide what are known as grid services, as to say, to regulate frequency and voltage. Now, all energy systems need storage to buffer mismatches between supply, supply and demand. And in UK electricity, it's mainly provided by gas. The average was 18 terawatt hours in of, of gas in store in 2019. Probably not enough, that's about nine days of supply. But gas is going. Well, demand is doubling. So already we can see we're gonna need twice that back up. And the mismatches are gonna grow because wind and solar are volatile. So we're going to need tens of terawatt hours of storage. Now, if you ask people what we've got, they say pumped hydro. That's 30 gigawatt hours. It's a thousand. It's a factor of a thousand too small. So I'm going to ask the question, could, not necessarily should, the UK be powered at an affordable cost in 2050 by wind and solar supported by storage without or with baseload? Or at the other extreme, would it be cheaper to provide all the flexibility, have a lot of wind and solar, have the flexibility coming from gas with CCS, which is low but not zero carbon? Gas plus CCS, because there are only three possible large scale sources of low carbon electricity in the UK. That's one. The others are nuclear, but if you're going to build it, you might as well run it. Very expensive to build and buy on BEX, and the same thing true there. An important preliminary point is that the more energy comes from wind and solar, obviously the less comes from the rest of the system. If it's 80% wind and solar, the rest is only 20%. But the rest has got to provide the full range of power when the wind and sun, it's not, not wind not blowing and the sun not shining. So it's gonna work at a very low load factor and it's going to be expensive. Now to answer this question, there are two things you need. And here's the first. You need to compare hour by hour supply and demand to ask when is there a surplus, and when's there a deficit. Now we don't know what the demand will be in 2050 and there are no publicly available, or no decent publicly available models hour by hour. But luckily, AFRI lent us their model. It's 570 terawatt hours, which is in the middle of the range of expectations for 2050. We have looked at other levels, I've come back to that. You need an hour by hour model of wind and solar generation based on real weather data over a long period. And we've used what are called the Ninja Renewables data, which some of you will know, over 37 years. I thought that was pretty good. And I asked the Met Office, is that enough? And they said, no, that period's not long enough to sample rare weather events. So we're going to put contingency into it, as you'll see. We've assumed a certain mix of wind and solar. You see the mix written there. And with that mix, by the way, as I've written at the bottom of the slide, the supply, uh, there's more, winter, more wind in the winter when there's more demand and less in the summer when there's less wind and there's more solar, more or less matches the seasonal distribution. The issue is not seasonal storage, it's volatility, as you'll see in a minute. Now, um, if uh, here I've shown over the 37 years, this is the cumulative deficit of surplus or deficit in each quarter. And this is the cumulative one in brown over the whole period. And you see the huge volatility in these blue lines. The, if you had 100% efficient storage, which we don't, then this uh, brown line, which since we've made the supply and demand equal, has to end up at zero over this period, would show the filling of a store. You could do everything with a store, which started here, went down, up and down, up to here. It'd have to be 
The size would have to be the difference of the maximum and minimums, 190 terawatt hours. But of course, it's not 100% efficient. So you've got to put more energy into storage than you want to get out. And if it was all hydrogen, for example, with a round trip efficiency of 41%, the surpluses would have to be bigger than the deficits, or equal to bigger than the deficits divided by 0.41. So this is all going to shift up. And some surpluses, the surpluses will get bigger, the deficits will get smaller and go away. That's the first thing you need. Second thing is you need to know what are the possible technologies and what are they likely to cost? So in our study, we've looked at a very large number of technologies. And for the purposes of modeling, we're going to look at three. Going to assume hydrogen. It's the best option for long stale electricity storage, provided there are suitable sites for making solution mine salt caverns. And there are in the UK. Without that, it's ammonia. By the way, I'll just mention it's normally said you'll convert hydrogen to power with turbines or fuel cells. We actually think four stroke engines are going to be as good or better option, I could say, or my technical colleagues think. Hydrogen in our modeling acts as a backstop. We provide it with a full power range, and it's always there, so it can always meet demand when the sun's not shining, the wind not blowing, and the other stores are empty. Then there's a whole range of other technologies in the middle here. And we've just chosen one because we can't say we modeled flow batteries and this and that. And we've chosen adiabatic compressed air. It's never been deployed at scale, so we don't really know what it will cost, but there are estimates available and we've made our own. And none of the others in this list here have been deployed at scale either, apart from pumped hydro and it can't get big enough. And then for the short term, we looked at lithium ion batteries. What about imports and exports? Having imports and exports, if you could control them, will help balance the system. But it would be mad to divide a, design, design a system that relied on them to keep the light shining because there are pan-European wind droughts where there's no wind anywhere in Europe, and we don't want to be reliant on that. Now, um, so I'll look first at solar and wind with just hydrogen storage and something for grid services. <laughs> With 570 terawatt hours demand, I need to go above that in supply because of efficiencies. And it, the, you have to get with 41% efficiency to at least 703 terawatt hours of wind and solar supply. At that level, the threshold means you're using everything. You're storing all surpluses. So you need colossal electrolyzer power, 169 gigawatts, and a huge store that will bankrupt you pretty rapidly. But if you go up a little bit in energy, you add another 35 terawatts hours or something like that a year to 741, funny number chosen because it's 30% bigger than demand, then the situation gets bigger, better. Now on the left here, I've shown what would happen at this energy with 130 terawatt hour store filled by 82 gigawatts of electrolyzers. And I'll tell you how I chose that number in a minute. So this is the amount of hydrogen in the store over 37 years. And it's jumping up and down every hour. Obviously, at this scale, you can't see that every hour, but it is. Now, the first point to make is if I just added, studied these stores, and I hadn't shown you this bit or this bit, you'd have reached a totally different conclusion about what storage you need. So that shows extremely strikingly but uh, you better not study one or two years or even a decade or even two decades. And I don't know if 37 years are enough. So we calculated what we needed and added 20%. Do I know if 20% is enough? No, I don't. So I'm going to come back and tell you what it would cost to put 40% a little bit later. And we can talk about other things. Well, the first thing, if you're Nick Eyre, and is he still in the room? Yes. You'd say, can't you deal with this as demand management? probably won't because we've discussed this. The answer is no, because in this period, well, first of all, you get periods of two weeks with no wind. Okay, you might manage that, but they cluster. And down in this period here, there are, I've forgotten how many, there's, you get up to a maximum missing demand of something like 
70 gigawatts, you can't do that with demand management. It helps. We should use demand management. Not going to solve this problem. And nor is storing heat, although we've looked at that. It will help, but it won't solve the problem. So then there's a point that's been missed. Everyone who's studied this hitherto has looked for the smallest possible store, which means you've got to store all surpluses. But you don't have to do that. You can have a small store charge rapidly or a large store charge slowly or somewhere in between. And the range is absolutely enormous. I mean, so the storage will work anywhere. If you get too small a char uh, charging power, when it's falling here, you can't keep up with the fall and the store will empty. If you get too, uh, get too uh, small a store below 92 terawatts, that's not enough to meet this fall. So there's a huge range here. And that's been missed in the literature, very surprisingly, because it sort of seems obvious. So what we do is we look for the combination that you've got to bring in costs at this point. What combination minimizes the cost? And we find it actually anticipating that we're going to add contingency to minimize the cost. And it, then we add 20% contingencies. So that's what we do. Now, a brief word on the cost. So the average cost of power we're going to look at and that's given by the annual, annual cost of the wind and solar we put in, for which we use basis estimates. And these, if you've got several stores, the annualized cost, capex and opex, you know, with a discount rate and all that uh, for each store, divided by the demand. That's the average that you're meeting, okay? Now, a very important point is, if I just looked at the cost delivered by a hydrogen store, I'd just I'd, I'd put amount delivered by hydrogen store here, which at this or all stores at this energy, it's 85 terawatt hours. So the cost of energy from a given store is much bigger than the average cost. The average cost you divide by 570 for the cost from a given store, it's 85. So the average cost, the contribution of a given store is only 15%. So the question is, can you get a market that pays the people who produce that very expensive stuff you need very occasionally? That's a question you've got to ask. Now I'm coming to costs. So this is with the, co the best costs that we have, and I'm not going through those, the average cost of power for with a 5% discount rate. And that's the threshold for it to work. And then as I go up in energy, uh, once you get above the threshold, you're not storing all the surpluses, and sometimes the store's full, and there are surpluses that are curtailed. So this is the cost if you curtail the, the surpluses, and there's a minimum of about 58 pounds. But those surpluses may have value. We don't know. They're not in, this, so this meets the demand that's anticipated by AFRI, but if there's extra power around for free, it could make other green hydrogen, it could be whatever. So there's a big uncertainty. Of course, the more of it, the less likely you're to sell it, especially at cost. So there's some uncertainty in here. And really to do this stuff, particularly with hydrogen, you should model the whole hydrogen economy together, which you can't because the predictions for other uses of hydrogen sort of run from here to Timbuktu. So you don't know how to do it. So we've just modeled electricity storage. So we probably slightly overestimated the cost because you need to look at the whole system and that should be done. Now, what about the sensitivities? Now, here's the interesting thing. If you put the contingency to 40%, it adds less than a pound per megawatt hour. And the reason for that is that storage is only providing 15% of the energy. And the, the the store, rather than the electrolyzers and the conversion, are a third of that. So the, the hydrogen store itself is only providing 5% of the cost. So you can add a bit to part of it, and you get a small effect. If the energy into store is 45 pounds, it's 13 pounds you've got to add. If the storage cost doubled, you'd be on this line here. So if you added all these things, and a higher discount rate, and that's multiplicative, it's not additive actually, you get to something over 90 pounds. This is the cost of the energy fed into the grid before transmission costs. 
because that's what we know to calculate. So it's not the same as the wholesale cost. It's a little bit higher than the wholesale cost. But in fact, there's a bit of an error here because we've taken these estimates for generating costs for wind and solar, but that's at the solar farm. I haven't put in the cost of transmitting it to the store. I think it's a few pounds, but I'm trying to get better feeling for that. I don't think it changes the conclusions. And I think this is quite conservative for 35 pounds. And we also look for 45 pounds. Now I've got three more slides. First of all, what if you add out of stores? Well, you've got to add something for grid services and just for interest with 2050 prediction of battery costs. If it was batteries and you had 15 gigawatts, one hour batteries it add about a pound. It's got to be there, but it's not huge. Now we've looked at compressed air and hydrogen. Adding compressed air to hydrogen probably reduces the cost, but both costs are very uncertain. So we're absolutely not sure of that. But the interesting thing is uh, even a small amount, if I give it priority in storing surpluses and filling deficits has a huge effect on the system. Now, before I get into that, let me say another thing. The people of model storage hitherto, who've looked at more than one store, have looked historically and said, this is the mixture of storage we'd have needed over the last 20 years or whatever they studied. You can't look historically in real life and we don't have perfect foresight. And this has received very little attention. You need to divide a merit order. What do you put into which store? Where do you take it out? And we've studied three in the course of this study. And, but it's not that the one I'm using isn't necessarily the best. And it has a snag that I'll come back to at the end. Now, uh, having said that about the merit order, what happens? So if you had no ACAS, we had 130 terawatt hours, charged with 82 gigawatts, delivering 85 terawatt hours. And that was the cost. I said it was just under 59 pounds. You'll see why I put these decimal points here in a moment. They don't mean much, of course. Now, if I added just 0.2 terawatt hours of compressed air, absolutely tiny compared to the 130 I started with, it would have a huge effect. It would immediately deliver 8.4 terawatt hours, which is given priority. It would reduce the amount delivered by hydrogen by 10%, although I've added almost nothing, and it would reduce the volume of hydrogen by 20%. Would only have a small effect on the cost, or would it? Remember, the cost is mostly dominated by the cost of wind and solar. So that's a tiny difference, like a pound, but it's 8% of the storage cost. If I go to slightly bigger compressed air, the cost, cost starts coming up again. But the interesting thing is it's a very, very flat minimum for a given amount of uh, compressed air. Here's a different set of parameters that give the same cost to 0.2%, and the, the system looks very different. So in some sense, this is quite good news. It means there's a lot of flexibility to adjust the system without screwing up the costs. So you can think about reliability, operability, buildability, if you're designing a system, as well as just cost. Now, this is the second last slide. Uh, what happens if you add base load? So I'm going to assume it's nuclear. And I'm going to assume base gives a range of costs. This is their medium cost at 78 pounds a megawatt hour. Now, if I just have hydrogen storage again, although we've just seen it's 58 pounds. So you'd think mixing in this is certainly going to put the cost up. But that's not necessarily true. Because when you mix in, when you put nuclear in, you need less wind and solar. So that brings the cost down again. So you've got to think about that. And it brings it down. It looks as if it's uh, slightly cheaper to not to have 50 terawatt hours of nuclear. But it's sort of in the uncertainties. And whether or not nuclear is economically desirable or not is not really clear. An important point is, however, that it brings the threshold down with 50 terawatt hours, instead of having to get above 703, uh, the, well, to get to around 750 for the cost minimum, it's at 690 of wind and solar. With 200, it's a 500. That makes it much easier to build all that wind and solar by 2050, because it's a hell of a lot of wind and solar and getting there be hard. 
And then my last point before the conclusions, Malcolm, I've taken the extreme of saying all the flexibility is provided by storage. What about the other extreme of saying it's all supplied by gas and CCS? So if you look at Bayes' gas and CCS production, projection with 100% load factor, depends on the co cost of gas, it's 80 pounds per megawatt hour. Gas has recently been five times this and probably four times it today, I don't know. Uh, that includes a cost for the CO2 because CCS isn't perfect, although it doesn't include a cost for methane emissions. Now, if I run that in conjunction with wind and solar, obviously it's not 100% load factor anymore. On the other hand, most of the cost is in the gas, so it's variable, not in the fixed cost. And I'm mixing it with cheap wind and solar. And if I do that, I come out at 75 pounds. So it looks as if this is more expensive than storage, which I was coming out with 58. But the pr we don't know what will happen to the price of gas as gas is phased out. Very likely, as there's less gas used, the more expensive sources will be closed first. So the cost will go down. So it may well be that these are competitive, and it may be best in the long run to have a mix. Now, here are my conclusions, Malcolm. I'll be very quick because you're getting annoyed with me. Uh, could you power GB with wind and uh, solar and hydrogen? Yes. At a cost below that, we've been paying it for wholesale in the last few months, but that's very exceptional. And be well below the CFDs for biomass at Drax and nuclear at Hinkley. On the other hand, a lot higher than the price in the last decade. But who said, who said decarbonization will be cheap? It won't. I focus on hydrogen alone as an existence theorem, not because I'm saying they are the solution. They're just simple to talk about, to look at one case. We're likely to meet a mix of stalls. ACAS was just one example, and perhaps with nuclear, some gas and CCS. Things to be done, people need to build full scenarios, a range of models, more thought on scheduling. And this uh, is a point I do want, to, if you'll excuse me, Malcolm. The, the scheduling we've discussed all involves close collaboration between all people involved in storage and generation of what goes into what store and when you take it out. The present system will never deliver that. It's going to need a new market with much greater coordination. And I could say something about our thoughts on that. But above all, the important thing is drive down costs. We've got to roll this stuff out and demonstrate it at scale. So we really know what it costs and get a move on. Okay. All right, so this is going to be a bit different. Um, I'm going to give a perspective from, um, I guess, from a catalysis perspective for hydrogen carriers, because all of the interconversions to turn hydrogen into carriers and turn carriers back into hydrogen need catalysts. And that's probably the area where chemistry, I'm, I'm from the chemistry department, so that's probably the area where chemistry is making the most significant contributions to this. But in particular, I'm actually a biological chemist. and. I think there are some interesting lessons we can learn from nature here and nature doesn't necessarily have all the answers, but a lot of the reactions that we need to be able to catalyze for hydrogen conversion for a future energy system nature has tackled millions of years ago. So um, if you look at a pond environment like this, there will be hydrogen being generated by microorganisms and hydrogen being captured by other microorganisms. You never see bubbles of hydrogen coming up to the surface because it's such a good fuel that it's just too good to lose. And there's always a bug ready to grab that hydrogen before it gets to the surface. And nature has its own ways of storing and, and using the hydrogen to power processes inside cells. So in green algae and uh, cyanobacteria, hydrogen is produced as a waste product to dispose of excess electrons from photosynthesis, particularly as photosynthesis starts up or shuts down. And so in this green algae, you've got the photosynthesis. 
bit faint, isn't it? Um, the photosynthetic electron transport chain where you have water splitting, releasing electrons, and normally those electrons will be channeled through to the Kelvin cycle where they're used to make biomass. But as photosynthesis starts up and you've got to get rid of those excess electrons before that all starts up, the electrons are diverted to an enzyme called hydrogenase that produces hydrogen gas. Unfortunately, these kind of organisms are not particularly useful for making hydrogen because that is only a side reaction. It's not the main reaction that happens. They're much better at making biomass. So if you wanted to use um, photosynthesis like this for making hydrogen, you'd be far better off using the algae to make biomass and then using pyrolysis of that to make the hydrogen because this is there's not been much success in diverting all of the electron flow through to hydrogen from these organisms because they, they're, they're much better at doing this um, biomass cycle. There are also organisms that capture that hydrogen in interesting ways. And this is a bacterium that lives in the soil or in water. And it has several of these hydrogenase enzymes. This is one sitting here on the membrane facing the periplasmic compartment of the cell. And it's able to capture hydrogen and pass the electrons from hydrogen through to uh, acceptors in the membrane, which are then ultimately used for reduction of oxygen to water. So it's, it's carrying out the reactions of a fuel cell. But instead of storing that energy, as we might think of charging a capacitor in, in the sense of electron separation, the charge is stored in the sense of a proton gradient across the membrane. So separation of positive charge. And it's the flow of that positive charge back through channels in the membrane that allows the synthesis of ATP, which is often seen as a storage molecule in the cell, the, the um, equilibrium between ATP and its dephosphorylated form ADP for, uh, allows you to power other processes in the cell. Um, hydrogen is also stored in chemical form in these microbes. This is an enzyme that couples the oxidation of hydrogen with flow of electrons right through the enzyme to reduction of a hydride carrier known as NAD, where you put the hydride on to make NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And this is an important hydride carrier that then functions in effectively transfer hydrogenation, transferring hydrogen onto a whole range of other molecules in the cell. So it, it, this is allowing all sorts of reductive reactions in the cell to happen powered by hydrogen. And again, it's this ability to use to, to store hydrogen, but in this case in chemical form. And because it's fairly costly to the cell to produce these enzymes, um, these are under tight regulation, so another enzyme senses the presence of hydrogen and switches on all of these at the gene level. So I'm going to look a little bit later at what we can learn from some of this. As I said, these reactions, are, uh, nature is, is carrying out a lot of these reactions rele relevant to a future energy economy. Um, we've just heard a lot about the, the um, generation of, of hydrogen with electrolyzers and um, as well as a direct electri electricity consumption in the grid. Um, it may be that we can store a lot of the hydrogen simply as hydrogen, as, as Chris has proposed. Um, in some cases, we're going to have to be able to convert the hydrogen into other light carriers, whether that's ammonia or light hydrocarbons or metal hydride materials. And so to some extent, we're going to need a cycle where we charge hydrogen carriers and then discharge to release the hydrogen when we need it. And, and catalysts are needed for all of these processes. And again, some similar reactions are already present in biology. Um, but these, some of these reactions are also very much active research in the chemistry department. And I'm not going to go into the details of that because I'm really not qualified to do that. But just to kind of show, I guess, where we've got little centers of, of hubs of activity going on in, in some of these areas of research. Um, a number of my colleagues are working in, the, in catalysts for um, photo or electrolytic hydrogen production. And this is a very chemistry department centric view of this. So I'm sure that there's lots of other activity going on in materials and engineering and physics and so on in these areas. So the, this is particularly the chemistry. Um, Ludmila Steyer is a fairly new recruit to the chemistry department, Ian McCulloch and Edmund Sang working in those areas. Um, in the catalysts for the hydrogenation of carriers, um, Edmund Sang and Bill David are, are working a lot on the um, ammonia synthesis. But we, of course, also need the decomposition of ammonia to release the hydrogen again. And um, they're also active in, in these areas of, of um, 
of discharge to release hydrogen back from those, um, as well as research into materials for hydrogen storage, um, so um, solid state materials for hydrogen storage in metal hydride form. So in the ammonia chemistry, I guess some of the catalyst challenges are that we're going to need more agile alternatives to Harbour-Bosch chemistry, which is very slow to start up and, and shut down if we're going to use ammonia storage as a way of, um, of again, smoothing fluctuations in grid electricity. We're going to need ways that we can turn that on and off much more rapidly. And electric catalytic, electrolytic um, production of ammonia from nitrogen is, is likely to be a, a key technology there. Um, and I'll come back at the very end again to sort of how there might be some inspiration from nature in this electrochemical ammonia production. Um, and I think I've mentioned some of these other areas. I guess storage of hydrogen in, in light hydrocarbon molecules is still heavily reliant on precious metals for that hydrogenation chemistry, um, for the hydrogenation and dehydrogenation steps. So I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about what we've done with enzymes. So I think enzymes are not going to, for, from microbes, are not going to be the answer to large-scale energy technology. So I'm certainly not up here to tell you that we should be using um, bacteria to, to solve our energy challenges for the future. But there are a few cases where um, enzymes from bacteria are quite useful in um, hydrogen technologies. And one of those is in cleaning up some of the chemical manufacturing. So this is um, a hydrogenase enzyme on an electrode surface acting as an electrocatalyst. And you can see that the, the lighter gray line here is an enzyme that's good at both production of hydrogen at low potentials and oxidation of hydrogen at high potentials. So these are, can be really reversible catalysts that function with no detectable overpotential in many cases for the, the hydrogen couple. So nature has really fine tuned these catalysts. They're also far more selective than precious metals for hydrogen cycling. They can work in high levels of carbon monoxide, high levels of sulfide, um, and uh, can work in mix, mixtures of hydrogen and oxygen, selecting out the hydrogen from that. So there's some real inspiration there in terms of what you can do with much more selective catalysts. Um, this is work from my colleague Fraser Armstrong in chemistry. Thinking along those lines, um, many reactions, in fact, about 10 to 20% of all industrial chemistry chemical transformations are hydrogenation reactions where hydrogen is added across a double bond. And usually those reactions are carried out with metal catalysts, often platinum group metals, and quite often requiring high pressure and high temperature to drive the reactions. In contrast, similar reactions are carried out by enzymes under very mild conditions. Um, and these are actually quite well established in industrial chemical manufacturing, particularly if you want to make stereoselective products, chiral compounds. So company, pharmaceutical companies like Merck will tell you that they'll always turn to biocatalysis if they want to make a chiral alcohol or a chiral amine. Um, and, but the way that those reactions are driven is using glucose to put the hydride back on the NADH. And so effectively, you're taking one hydrogen atom off glucose and throwing away the rest of the sugar at the end, and that usually just gets burnt. So biocatalysis is not very carbon efficient, um, atom efficient, um, or um, sustainable in the way it's being run. We started to think if we could replace the glucose with hydrogen, to put the hydride back on the NADH, then we're turning these biocatalytic reactions into hydrogenation reactions, just as carried out with the metal catalyst. So sort of the best of both worlds in terms of the mild conditions, but the selectivity and atom efficiency of, of hydrogenation. So um, this was a technology that we've developed over a number of years in my group, where we put a, a series of enzymes attached onto a carbon support, using that to, as for electron flow between the enzymes, so that we can use hydrogen gas to drive the recycling of the NADH, and then use that to do a hydrogenation reaction of a particular organic molecule. I know this is not really fuel chemistry, but what it is doing is cleaning up some of the chemical manufacturing, which at the moment is using um, high purity hydrogen, often high temperatures and high pressures. So it's, it's some of the sort of demand reduction for, for energy and chemical manufacturing, as well as allowing um, cleaner chemical manufacturing. And we spun out a company last year to commercialize this biocatalysis approach um, and are getting a lot of interest in, in the context of sort of cleaning up chemical manufacturing. 
Um, we've also, in a similar way, um, used enzymes to put hydrogen onto the flavin cofactor. And this is really, again, another one of nature's solutions to hydrogen storage. It looks a lot like the sort of putting hydrogen on and off um, storage molecules. And again, being able to drive um, hydrogenation reactions here in alkene reduction using hydrogen gas with this sort of system. So there's a, a very wide range of chemical transformations you can drive in this sort of way. Um, so just to finish very in the last few seconds, uh, the sort of inspiration from biology, the way that um, hydrogenase enzymes carry out the hydrogenation reactions involves splitting hydrogen to give a hydride on the metals and a proton and H plus on a nearby base. And so that's a heterolytic cleavage of hydrogen, a completely different mechanism to that on platinum, which um, is a bit more like the frustrated Lewis pair mechanisms that chemists may be familiar with um, for splitting hydrogen. So it opens up completely new mechanistic options for how you might tackle um, hydrogen uh, oxidation or hydrogen production. Um, there's another group of enzymes that use a, a diion site, but again, have a nearby base poised here to accept a, a proton from hydrogen or to donate a proton when they're making hydrogen. And those sorts of design principles have translated through into a nickel catalyst that is active as an electrocatalyst over a wide pH range for both production of hydrogen and oxidation of hydrogen. And um, particularly when it's sort of linked into proton transfer and electron transfer pathways. And so that gives an idea of how these sort of design principles from biology can translate into new catalyst systems. And finally, um, the obviously, catalysis for nitrogen to ammonia is going to be important, whether it's in reducing the energy demand of the Haber-Bosch process that accounts for one to 2% of world energy usage, or whether it's increasing our production of ammonia as a store for hydrogen. In nature, that is essentially done like an electrocatalytic reaction because nature stores electrons on this complex um, metal sulfide cluster um, in the form of hydrides. So accumulating H plus from solution, adding electrons to form hydrides that bind on the surface of the metals and then are able to um, form dinitrogen. So the overall reaction is like an electrocatalytic reaction. And although there are many secrets we don't understand from the way that this enzyme nitrogenase works, and it's certainly not going to be robust enough for energy technologies, there, there are likely to be some really important clues there for how we might develop new catalysts. So I know that's a bit of a different perspective from what we <laughs> um, what you were perhaps expecting on hydrogen carriers, but I uh, hope that's been interesting anyway. Great. Thanks a lot, Kylie. Okay. So we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. So are there any questions? Um, John, start. Yeah. Um, yes, I've got a question straight observation for Chris. I, mean, I think you, uh, you, first of all, you emphasize that you don't think the market can resolve this. Um, it doesn't seem to me that it's going to be resolved through any other form of decentralized decision making. So the implication seems to be some kind of centrally driven, centrally directed plan for that. Um, the second point is, is, is really about your extreme weather events. And I wonder whether it's worth reflecting on how we respond to that kind of emergency. Because it seems to me, if it's something that potentially only happens every, every 40 years, it becomes a national, something like a national emergency. And you have different ways of dealing with it. You know, you shut down industrial production for two weeks, which, which we can live with. Uh, you tell people they can't charge their electric cars for two weeks, which would be a pain for some of them. So on the first point, since you're co-author of the chapter saying we use two <laughs> systems, I agree with you. Uh, on the second, uh, the trouble is with climate change. We don't know if these frequency of these things, but I mean, you and I are one of the few people in this room old enough to remember the three day week. You can do things in extremis, and, but you know, there are big amounts out there. We've thought about a lot about other things. I mean, could you, you know, suddenly keep a reserve of iron, for example? You chuck it into water and it makes hydrogen. So you have a reserve and you make a lot of hydrogen at short notice. Trouble is with that, you've got to keep available the infrastructure to turn iron into hydrogen for use once every 40 years. 
and it's bloody expensive. So we are thinking about those things. But in the end, just making the stall bigger seemed the simplest thing at the moment anyway. Um, Nick. Yeah, two, two questions. First for Chris and the second one, I'm not sure which. Can you speak up, Nick? I'm not hearing. Second, I'm not quite sure. So the first, uh, it's, it's really a follow up to, to John's point. I, I actually think that switching off industry for two weeks is perhaps counterintuitively energy storage, because what it means is that the, the steel, the aluminium, the ammonium nitrate, the cement that you use has been produced in advance. You're actually just storing the energy in commonplace uh, chemical materials rather than hydrogen. I'm not claiming that's a solution and that we don't need hydrogen, I'm just saying, the more I think about demand response, the more I become convinced it's usually storage, right? It's you, you, you've usually got some storage mechanism behind that. The second question is about use of, of hydrogen, which is why I'm not sure who it's the question's for. But Chris, you said the round trip efficiency was, was 41%. And presumably that's because, as you said, you are modeling the electricity system and therefore you're assuming that the role of hydrogen is in the pro, in a, a cycle that goes work to hydrogen to work, but actually, at least quarter of the energy we use in the system is is low temperature heat. Um, so you're basically proposing throwing away sixty percent of that energy, whereas actually, if you put it on a district heat, these sorts of processes, uh, yeah, electrolyzers on a district heating network, you could up the efficiency of, of that. I think. Right, but Kylie, okay. uh, you thought a lot about uh, efficiency as well, so you might have some comments. Kylie, <clears throat> do you want to answer that first? Well, I, I think I, yeah, I probably haven't thought in that kind of big systems way, but yeah, I think we probably have to be much more creative about how we're, yeah, linking together the aspects of the energy. Chris, well, you're right about the heat. I mean, we are assuming that 41%, some people think that's a little bit ambitious, but with 2050, yeah. that assumes 74% efficient electrolyzers and 55% yeah. conversion. But that's but, from an electricity mindset, that's my point. It's not right, of course. No, 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 we we're aware of that. Uh, the other thing to say is that there's a thing I didn't mention, there are some possible savings in here. You can make reversible electrolyzers. So if you think about storing surplus wind, Something that can act as an electrolyzer when there's surface wind and power production when there isn't be great. The only problem with that is the best candidates are solid oxide and they produce hydrogen at room pressure. And to store it underground, you've then got to have a compressor and that costs you, whereas other electrolyzers produce at 30 bars. So it's a very complicated issue. For turning on and off energy, uh, industry, yes, uh, but it's a lot. I'll show you the figures on those bad periods. But that's the sort of thing we've got to think about, and it's part of the solution. Along with having, for this use of surplus, we've been trying to think of needs that could may grow up, that aren't in the present demand, that can use spasmodic electricity. For example, we have a lot of biomass, you've got to dry it. So you shove it in a hanger and you pump hot air through it. You don't care if that stops for half an hour and then starts again. We need to think about these sorts of things. Great, thanks. Phil. Um, yeah, thank you, Chris and, and Kylie, both really interesting. I can't hear you, Phil, you know I'm getting to speak up. I particularly like the point about the 1.3 factor of generating more um, to reduce the total amount of storage you needed. And from your numbers, I take it that the cost is not so much with the storage volume, the terawatt hours, but with the capacity, so the, the renewables and presumably electrolyzers, and how much overcapacity you'd want to produce, presumably depends on that ratio of the cost of okay. how much do electrolyzers go down, how much does renewables go down. Well, we play with those numbers. And Kylie, see, how much should we play with those numbers? How much could that happen? In the pure hydrogen case, I showed you the, the huge threshold of costs, and it comes down, and as a minimum. And you want uh, about 30% overcapacity. I hate the word overcapacity, by the way, because if there's base load, it's not clear how it's defined. If you can sell the surface, it's different. But on the other hand, you're not going to sell the surface. In, 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 I mean, if you can sell it forever, you go to an infinitely large system and storage would cost you nothing. Uh, you know, the possibility of getting rid really of going to change as energy goes up. 
not sure I, under, I heard all your yeah, question the, properly. The kernel of my question was, did you play with the relative cost of electrolyzers versus, so if we had super cheap renewables, presumably you'd... If you had super cheap renewables, I would do... Uh, that oh, one if it gets... If, if, if we come down to 10 pounds a ter, um, megawatt hour or something for renewables, obviously you will want to go to higher energy, I think. Yeah, because that was going to be my question at the moment, is that quite a number of places in the, in the planet are at $10, about seven pounds. Right. So, and and so you look at places like Chile, uh, the Gulf, the Gulf area, all of those are coming in. Wells, you know, uh, I think the cheapest now is being point, uh, you know, under uh, nine point eight cents per, per per kilowatt hours coming in. So that's what's at nine dollars. How does that change the equation? Well, the difficulty is building enough capacity because uh, you know. There is one national grid capacity that has about 700 terawatt hours of wind and solar in 2030. But if you look at the build rate, you put in the realistic capacity factors, you've got to go way above the government's present target for building offshore wind. Oh, by the way, today I read in the FT at lunchtime online, it just said that Boris Johnson said he wants more offshore wind and they're changing the planning conditions, which is interesting. And you'd have to really speed up the construction of solar. Uh, and so I think, you know, there's quite a lot for not getting to these huge, mm -hmm. that's the argument for bringing in, actually bringing in compressed air, it's more efficient. I didn't say that, that lowers the threshold too, and bringing in nuclear that lowers the threshold. Maybe we'll By the way, another point, sorry. There's a whole world where you could put PV. Uh, yeah. yeah, but remember, Malcolm asked me that, about this before. Why aren't we just importing ammonia? We <laughs> remember we are trying to use surplus wind and solar, which would otherwise be thrown away. So it's free in some sense. So this is about storing surpluses in the UK. It's not about looking at the whole system. Would it be desirable to have some things that are imported? And if you think about imports to deal with that bad patch in the filling. You've got to keep the infrastructure available to use it very seldom. That's very difficult to do. One last question. Can I, ask one? One? I wonder how much do you have to take into account increased extreme weather events coming from climate change in okay. models? So well, I've talked a lot to the people who work on the effects of climate change. And it's quite interesting because so there, are, there are papers saying there'll be so much more solar in Germany, so much less wind, this will happen in France, this will happen. They don't even agree, those papers, on the, on the sign, let alone the magnitude. And the, the thing you really mustn't do is average them, because you say that the <laughs> average is not representative of that. There's zero sign. <laughs> but they all agree it's likely to get more volatile. Yeah. Or, but, or let's say, but the volatility, even if it remains at the present, is, is the issue. And I mean, really, we need more modeling on that. And on this weather question, that our satellite observations going back to earlier than the period I looked at in the 60s and early 70s, when wind was lower, it's due to the phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. And, but they haven't been turned into ersatz wind and solar. I'd love to study a period with much lower wind. That's one of the recommendations at the end. Somebody ought to do it. We're just sort of touching the surface here. And I never finish because I keep coming up with new problems. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any last questions? In other words, in other case, I will just suggest that we just thank our speakers in the usual way. <laughs>
And then you look at people who looked at the costs in different parts of the country, and they're way different. Uh, they depend on how close you can get rid of the brine, for example. In Cheshire, you need to spend, you know, 70 or 70 million on pipes to bring in water and get rid of brine. In East Yorkshire, it's five million, it makes a big difference. We're looking at this, the H21 North of England study, which looked about a power in the North of England eating with gas using their Yorkshire estimates. So that's what we're using. And we think there's enough. Um, they come in clusters. You typically have well, what H21 have is 10 cabins, each of 3,000 kilometers, uh, 3,000 cubic, 300,000 cubic meters, what am I saying? Uh, sharing surface facilities, which saves costs. So the footprint is not enormous, but it's not trivial either. So that needs looking at, and particularly if you're going to use compressed air, which needs underground space at much lower energy density, like 20 or something like that. Great. Thank you very much. All right. You can stretch your legs or whatever while we let the others come in. Yeah. 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 Yeah.